this map, which is only a small part of northern Europe, i.e. a small part of France, actually, each dot represents either one or a cluster of cemeteries. That, that is the extent of the loss in the First World War. You can come through Calais and drive an hour down here, and you'll never be far from a cemetery. That's 100 kilometres. Drive for 100 kilometres, and you'll always have a cemetery within sight or just over the horizon. And it also, people talk about a world war. People talk about the Second World War and the First World War, and therefore they seem to assume they had similar characteristics. The First World War was very different. The First World War, everything happened in a very narrow band of land. This is what people talked about, the trench warfare, that they got to this point and stopped. So everything happened in a 10-kilometre wide corridor that went from, the, from Switzerland to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the Channel. So the Germans never penetrated more than 10% of the French territory, but they took over 80% of its industrial capacity, the coal fields of Lons and such. And so you can imagine for four years, the two largest political industrial complexes of the world threw everything that those countries could build into a narrow 10 kilometer stretch. Imagine that everything that your country produces for the next five years ends up in this narrow area. The shells, the equipment, the horses, the people, huge numbers. Today, we still find tons of munitions. They found a tank a couple of years ago that somebody had buried. If you walk around this area, you still see areas. I think we were doing some work in, um, in Teepval and discovered German trenches that nobody had seen for the last 100 years. Um, we still get war dead because, for example, last year a JCB driver hit, a, hit a, a, a bomb that was in his field. He gets a war pension because he's been killed by the First World War. Uh, two gentlemen in Ypres who found a hand grenade and started playing football with it. They both lost their lives when the hand grenade went off. So you'll find all in this area still tons of munitions, tons of, of, of real estate. It's just extraordinary, the numbers. Um, and I was talking to someone a, a few minutes ago, and we'll go back to it, but you also need to understand that upwards of three, 400,000 people are lost in this area. Their bodies were never found. They're the missing. So as the work takes place, as parts of France start to develop and as building work takes place, we're still finding uh, the remains of First World War soldiers on a regular basis. So although we recognise and we commemorate each one of them by a headstone or by a memorial, we're still finding the actual remains of soldiers who are still in the ground. The only positive thing being, whereas they've been unknown for 100 years, there's a better chance today that you'll be able to find out their name or indeed where they come from by research, DNA. Some of those elements now, they've probably got a better chance of being... Um, identified than, say, if they had been found in, um, in the 30s or the 40s so or the 50s. So you put them through a pretty scientific process, if, you look at... If we can. Yes. I, I, the, thing, the thing that's important is what you find with the body, because for us it's unequivocal. We only record what we know to be a fact. Yeah. So if we know the name, we know the name. If we know what the regiment is, we know what the regiment is. If we know what they be, But we won't speculate... So we don't take a leap of faith. And a lot of people focus on that by the fact that people who are looking for these now, because it becomes more a historic, and they'll go, I found 15 Canadian soldiers. Why? Oh, well, because there was a maple leaf nearby. It doesn't make them Canadian. Well, I think they're Canadian, and I've done all this research. And there's a lot of historical people there who, if you're a historian, you're trying to sell a story, you, at some point in every story, you'll come to a point where you either have to stop or take a leap of faith. And we won't make those leaps of faith. We stop at where the facts lead us. You need uniform dog tags, some number, something like that. And then you need all sorts of orientation in terms of, well, who was fighting in the area at the time, what was recorded in. The great thing about the military is we, you know, they tend to record as much as possible. So, you know, go back to diaries, go back to uh, letters, go back to, and try and build up a pattern. 
Um, but sometimes you get to the point where you can differentiate, maybe it was one of two people, but you'll never know whether it's one or the other, and that makes both of them unknown. Yes. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you get pressure within, well, it's either A or B. Well, it might be A or B, but is it A or is it B? Because if it's A, we're not going to make that mistake. We're not going to make that mistake. Perfect. Thank so anyway, let's move on. Are we going to go back out through the front? Um, it is possible. Um, that that's the key. You've, you've, no, you've hit the nail on the head. Is there's a couple of reasons. Um, some of the issues. The first issue is what we'll do. We'll go through and round the. Uh, yeah. Well, you can get down. Just try not to get too deep. Should have put a block on there when we. That's all right. Three things on the DNA piece. The first is there's a limitation on the the, the resource. Yeah. You know, there's you know there's not a limitless resource of DNA across the world. Yeah. Um, because not many people need it, and it's up to three minutes. And then the second thing is, you're right. What you need to be able to do, you need to understand enough of somebody that you can find a relative. Yes. Someone yeah, you can take that. Yeah. So we do have. DNA. So you know, sometimes will you, will you get teeth that are still available? Oh, yeah, right yeah. Now? False teeth. teeth. False Fantastic. Teeth. And teeth, yeah, they last yeah, forever. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, do you guys do real teeth last that long? Stay around they that long? Still, yeah, they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can get DNA. If you know, someone takes this from here and they have Joe, Joe Smith's uh, nephew, you can yeah. try that one. And we can find it through and then take the DNA. And what's quite nice about that is if you link it up and eventually that person can be buried as a name, right. then often will the relatives come to the burial. Yes. And then that's yes. the first time they understood that they had a connection to the First World yes. War in a very real sense. And then we'll go take a right through here. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, is there a database where people can submit yeah. their own DNA? Uh, no, there's not. There's not. Not. Not that the commission holds. The actual identification process is a is a national one. Um, we pass over the details that we have, and then the investigation is done by the country themselves. Yeah. yeah. Is that the third piece? Uh, the third, uh, yeah, the third piece is whether countries are committed to be able to yeah. to do that, because the argument then. Yeah. Up? These are exactly. In fact, we'll just stop here for a second. I'll, I'll focus on that. Um, in fact, no. If it's okay, can we just go down to where those four are? Right. Um. First of all, these are all blanks. So exactly as you said, these are all blanks that will have come from, in most cases, Bulgaria, which is where we're currently getting most of our stone from. Okay. Most of the uh, headstones that are in the majority of cemeteries are um, limestone. So originally they were limestone. It was the iconic use of that material. Um, We've had a few problems with limestone. It's very difficult to get hold of nowadays. In the quality, it's, it's, it's not mined uh, or quarried as much as it used to be. Okay. The other thing is that a lot of limestone buildings that were built around the same time are going through the same renovation process. So um, hard cost realities is we can't pay as much as a London bank for good, good Portland. Um, so Portland is something we've not been able to use for a while. So we've been tending to use a variety of alternatives. Initially, we quite often used Botticino. Um, I'll get sacked for the next bit, but I can't stand it. I think it's awful. Okay. Um, it looks like somebody's marble kitchen 
that's what I put in my kitchen. I don't put it in a. Okay. Uh, I don't like it. Okay. Um, but it's very durable, um, and you can get so it does does flatten off after a few years. Okay. Uh, and then we use a new one. Uh, in fact, I can't even tell the difference. I think it's the next one is Veratza. So one of these is Veratza, and one is Portland. But Veratza is a very well. You can tell is you need to be a stone expert to tell the difference between the two. So we tended to use Veratza. Now we I talked about scale. We are consuming the world's entire stock of Veratza stone. Really? Yeah. So we bought up the world's supply. What, year what, on year. What else would Veraxis be used for? Is this for the primary purpose? No, no, it, it can be used, used for a whole variety of, you know, in the same way that if you're building your villa on the south of France okay. or, you know, if you're a Russian millionaire building your, your mansion in Sloan Square, you'd like a good bit of Veraxis. Yeah, like Nowadays, you're going to have to deal with Bottacino because it's the only thing you'll get. Uh, yeah, very good. Uh, but yes, these, they come in as blanks. Uh, when they come in as blanks, they then are sent into the headstone production unit, which by its name denotes actually does um, uh, most of the etching and for on, on these blanks. And it's a bit noisy there, so I'll explain what's happening in there before you go in. Um, and bear in mind from a health and safety point of view, we, we should all have hard hats on and yellow vests. So if you can just shoot through and be safe for me, I'd be very grateful. Um, don't, don't dawdle and don't touch anything. Um, the Originally, all of these 1.1 million headstones will have been done by hand. So there was no machinery. They were all done by hand. Um, not as big a deal as maybe one suspects, because the one thing there wasn't a shortage of after the war was manpower, a manpower that needed jobs. So, you know, after training them to do it, you know, that, that's what a lot of the people, and some of the people who still work for us, their families were brought into the commission originally at the very start. And we have some, we have some dynasties who work in the commission. Um, you know, we've got one family, there's a, um, um, a gardener who works down in Vimy. Um, his father came across in the Second World War. He was injured, he stayed, he met a French lady. He decided to stay in France, thought, what the hell do I do for a job? Um, somebody said, come and work for the commission. Now his, his, his son works for one. Um, we've got um, others who, um, they stayed here during the Second World War. So we have grandfathers who stayed in the Second World War. The Germans allowed them to stay to look after the uh, cemeteries. So they were British nationals living in France and the German occupation looking after the cemeteries. And their families have continued to work for the commission. One or two of them lost their lives because they helped the resistance and were caught for collaboration, and are, mem and are also remembered in our in our cemeteries. So there's a whole host of history of uh, interesting. There's another gardener I have who, in the UK, used to have to do what was called national service. So when you got to 18, you had to join the military for two years before you went on with the rest of your life. Well, they still had to join the UK military. And we had one, we got one guard and he spent his whole life over here. So he spoke French like a native. Yeah. So when he joined the British Army, the army sent him to North, Northern Ireland because we had troubles in all Ireland. And he was a spy for the British Secret Intelligence Service for two years, yeah. just speaking French. So he was a spy for two years and then came back to be a gardener. Well, yeah, and you wouldn't know any different. There you go. Very neat. So anyway... Yeah, so these are we today we don't do them by hand. Today we do them by computer. So obviously what we do is we feed all the details in. It goes into a machine. There are four machines if need be. Um, it's quite a relatively dull process. You press the button and it does it. Oh, that's a good question actually. Uh, it depends on the on the detail that's required. So if you get a particularly intricate badge, um, that's where most of the work goes. And also, if you get a personal inscription, um, what you'll see when you look at them out the side is that you have different personal inscriptions. So although the badge and the name and the regiment and the details were given by the commission, you were also allowed to have a small personal inscription at the bottom of each headstone. And you were allowed a limit after which you then paid for it by, I think, a penny a letter. 
So if some, particularly Second World War, had quite detailed personal inscriptions, First World War, they tend to be biblical and they tend to be short. Second World War, they tend to be longer and they tend to be more personal. So you get, you know, son of chief constable of Wessex, my darling son, da, da, da. Because the First World War, they all tend to be very similar. Okay. So if we want to go through... This is a special project we did for ah. the Canadian Edston. Sorry, this is this is Camille. Now, just just by sheer coincidence, we happen to be doing a Canadian one. Sheer coincidence. So what you'll see as well is if you look at the bottom, I'll show you outside, you'll see each one has to be logged all the way through so that we don't put the wrong headstone on the wrong point. And we have done that. I mean, mistakes happen. But I've been to cemeteries where they're the same headstone. So someone's gone along and replaced the wrong one. Um, you can always rectify that, but it does look a bit embarrassing at start. So they'll go, for example, that one's to Picardy, that one will go to Englefield, I don't know where that is, that one's to Buffel. Do you have members of a family killed together, like brothers, are they typically buried together? Yeah, the, the, thing, the thing for us, which I think is truly unique in a way that cannot be replicated elsewhere, is they were buried where they fought, which is why we've got so many cemeteries. They weren't harvested in the same way that the Americans or the Germans did. So we don't have huge cemeteries, but we do have hundreds of smaller ones. That means that if you visit them, you're in the place that they lost their life. It also means that when we find someone... It means when we find someone who is new, we always make sure they're buried in the same cemetery where their comrades fell. So I don't care where it is, I don't care how difficult it is, we get them in the ground with their comrades. When you say this is Portland, is, it, is this cement? Or is no, no, it's Portland as in the Portland quarry, so it's a limestone. Okay. So, it was interesting that is a uh, a good question there that I'm sure you'd be interested in that uh, we had um, the reason we have so many cemeteries is that the intent initially was to make sure that they were buried where they fought so we have thousands of small cemeteries we didn't congregate or harvest yeah. them so it means it's a special link to the fact that if you go to the grave in the majority of occasions you are where they lost they their life you're looking out over the same landscape. You're looking at the same features. You're on the same ground as they fought and died on. And if we find somebody and we need to bury them, we will put them back in a cemetery that relates to where they lost their life. So we don't have an open generic cemetery that people go into. They go back to where their pals were. They go back to the people they fought with. They live the rest of eternity with their pals. And that can cause a bit of difficulty. People like television these days, so they say, it's not a very televisual experience, Samadhi. It's not about television. It's about that's where they lost their life. That's where they deserve to be. Um, once, once we have, obviously, the, they've been completed, you can sense here, this is where we store them ready to go. So these are all headstones that have been completed. These will go to Manchester in the UK, Cambridge. Most of these actually in the UK. Manchester as a grave. Uh, Manchester the city. No, Manchester the city. But oh, in fact, no, yeah. But these go back there because we have some graves there. Yeah. Okay. Have, the only the only country or the only continent we don't have graves is Antarctica. That's it. Okay. 
everywhere else we're in a, I can't remember how many it was 132 countries or something I think it is yeah okay um, yeah, we have a lot of graves in the UK because okay. originally the first couple of months when no one could understand the context of the war the the the, the casualties and particularly injured people were sent home and they passed away so there. they passed away there and they're buried in graveyards in the UK okay. Okay. it was only when you started to get the sort of casualty numbers that people said we're not going to send this number of people home. Can you imagine the effect on the public of seeing caravans of dead bodies going through their yeah, tent? Yeah. We need to find a solution locally. Local. And that's when Fabian Ware, who established the, the commission, he had no role in the war. He wasn't allowed to join up. So he took an active part of a graves registration unit. And again, the great thing about the military is they record everything. So he started taking those records, yeah. starting to put them together and identify where people were so that we could actually make, when the time came, a record and actually confirm that particular, this is where, you know, this is where they are and form a, uh, a cemetery. Yeah. But we've got graves here that will be going to Africa, Asia, India, all over the world. They go from here. Are we going that way? I get lost in my own living room. <laughs> Every, every single feature in every single cemetery, so just to remind you, that's just over 1,200 cemeteries, everything is unique. It was built to order. So every bench is different. Every gate is different. There is no such thing as just, just knock me up 50 of those gates. Everyone has to be made. So we have primarily now to take raw material, and it has to be built by our own craftsmen. We cheat a bit on benches. We've started to use generic benches because, boy, that would just be too much. But gates, every gate is different, and you'll see that as we go through. Um, the symbol for any of the Newfoundland soldiers, was it different than the Canadian Maple Leaf? Because uh, that's they a good still question, actually. I'm there. trying to think. I think I'm trying to visualize. I think they are. We'll find out soon enough. But I'd have to look. Without, I, it's not something I, I, I'd be honest as registered with me. Yep. But if you go to Beaumont Hamel, you will see a um, memorial panel, um, which yeah. is at the foot of the I caribou. Would, I would assume that you have to do some graves that say NFL Leaf. Yeah, yes. But there's one name on there that survived the war. Look for a gentleman called Pilgrim. He didn't die in the war. He was put on by mistake. Mm -hmm. He's the only person I know who we commemorate who actually is still alive. Mm -hmm. Well, I say still alive. Yes. I think he's dead now. Yes. So, yes. Go. Okay. And we're going to go this way round. It's always looking this, this tidy. Hello, my what is your name? Bonjour. 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 Don't we all know? But this is a good example of what we have to contend with 20 years 40 or 50 or 100 years of degradation yeah. okay. so and each one is unique from each individual thing so every single one so this would be from Marel we oui? yeah so you guys redo the benches and everything every, every 40, all of this too years or however long they, some, some, to be fair, some have lasted quite a while. Um, depends how they've been treated or not. So, but we'll do every single one, everything here on site. And then we're going that way. Good. And this way. Sorry. I say these are examples of, I said that everything is unique, but you can also see the sheer variety. Because the one thing that amazes me is that it would have been so much easier for the architects to just go, you know what, that's a cemetery, now build me another 500 of those. Every single one looks the same, but is unique, which is pretty remarkable, really. Um, all the detailing, it's just... And probably so more, different. more accustomed to what the area, what was in vogue at the time, at, at yeah. the area where the, where the soldiers Pe People learned on the job, so they said, do you just need to, you know, do you know how to do a door? 
well, I'm a shipbuilder. I know how to do that. I'll, I'll just build a door the same way I do shipbuilding. Uh, so you see the techniques are all so different. Um, or some people will put their own mark or they have done something in their own house so they know that they did that. Um, there are great stories about the, the sort of humankind on the basis of, um, uh, and they, they sound a bit discourteous, but I'm sure if you put yourself in the mind of you know, someone who's just come through, the, survived the First World War, his house has been obliterated, he's got to build his own house, his family's are nowhere to live. So, so, you know, wh why is that gate that size? Well, probably because at home he needed a gate that size, so it's just as well to build two, yeah, put one there and take one home. Yeah. Because there's scrap wood, and you know, at that stage, and the sort of ingenuity of people. And he probably did it. Why did he do it like that? Well, probably because that's the style he needed for his house at home. Um, and yeah, I mean, those practicality, uh, it's yeah. all ingenuity, exactly, exactly. So, yes, but no, overall, all of these, of course, ready to go out. But we do the whole thing, all, all, all built, custom built. So, hopefully, that'll last us. Another hundred years, at least. Um, and the, the danger for us, of course, is we need to keep these skills running. Because these are not skills that are, people don't get degree level now. Uh, it's just making sure we can do it. Because everything has to be custom made. Particularly, as I say, the difficulty is the ironware. The ironware is even worse because that's very difficult to forge. Or sometimes we do have to make compromises, but we try. Good. Now, we are definitely going out through that door. Quite warm today. We're very lucky with the weather. It's been torrential rain for, for the best part. Nelly? Yeah, that's fine. Sorry? No, we're just going to do quickly the stoneworking shop. So there's not a lot to see today, but you're doing great. This it's is fabulous. Um, all the uh, inevitably all the stone has to be cut because none of it is again standard features. It's all bespoke. Uh, that includes everything up to and including crosses of sacrifice. Um, all solid, in this case, limestone. Um, and when things go wrong, we keep the bits as well because um, we'll crush these down and we'll use them for paths. Everything gets recycled. Nothing gets thrown away. Uh, the one thing we've had which has been somewhat distasteful of late is we did learn the lesson that um, when we have headstones and we replace headstones, we, we, we cut the name off uh, before we remove them because uh, we were having people who were seeking to find headstones um, and we found them on for sale on eBay and various other places as well which can cause distress not 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 in recent years but in the 40s or the 50s if you wanted to replace a headstone well people would use them for their paths recently someone took their path up in a house not far from here and oh turned it over and they were headstones um, but of course if you've gone through the First World War and you've seen that sort of, you know, it's a different mindset right. now to, you know, hey, you know, I, I, I watch so many people die, what, what, what's the issue of a headstone? I'm, I'm reusing it. Yeah. So we still get some of that every now and again. Um, and what we try and do is we try and hold in as much stock as we can, because the trouble is we can't always guarantee we're going to get it when we need it. Exactly. That's always yeah, the problem. Yeah. So it's always a balance of supply against demand. Uh, in fact, let's just have a look at these while I'm going to go off script now. So, the, 
Lisa. Sometimes we might, but, but it rarely happens rarely in the time happens, we need it. Really time we need it. And then you get, yeah, I get it. You buy it when you need it. That's probably the most. Um, what you're seeing here by sectors, um, headstones get damaged or they, they, they get vandalized or they, um, uh, there isn't much of that to be fair. Um, the amount of vandalism we get is pretty small. Um, and most often or not, it's just bored, people who are bored with nothing to do. I, I, I'm not aware in my short time here, I, I've seen anything that is, you know, motivated by anything other than just boredom. Um, you know, but these will be ones that were relating to people, uh, either the headstone was damaged or it was broken or it's fallen over. And so what the guys will do is these are horticultural sectors. These will be for places looking for one I can pronounce here, you know, Villas Bretonneux. So for the Australians, that will be going down. So that will just be a replacement for if you went down there now, you'd either find a temporary marker or a damaged headstone. And we'll be putting these up. It's a regular, constant way of doing it. What we try and do is, the first thing, because somebody mentioned it earlier, is the first thing we try and do is, if a headstone becomes illegible, you can't read it, and that's read in good light, that's not in the middle of the night or from 15 yards, um, the first thing we'll try and do is re-engrave it. You can re-engrave a headstone twice before you need to look to replace it. And we have re-engraving teams that go around and, and just re-engrave. If it's got to that stage where you can't re-engrave it, it's too badly damaged, then we'll replace it. And the plan is to try and get a replacement in the ground within 96 days. So from the time we know of it until the headstone is back, is, we try and do it in 96 days. And that is including checking the records, checking it's, it's, it's the whole process. Um, and as I say, if we've got, if they don't work well now, we've learned our lesson. So, you know, all the old headstones are all smashed up and are held back here. We don't leave them on site. As soon as we know, we, we destroy them all. Fortunately, we don't have too many errors. But all, all systems have a certain amount of, um, what's the word, uh, wastage. Is he still in there? No, it's, it's, that's good. Just to let you know to exit and take and go back this way rather than to the door. Okay, you want to come back through there. That's right, that's fine. Yeah, we can I do that. We can do that. So next we'll go into the woodwork or the metal workshop. Blacksmith. Blacksmiths. This is my favourite one, actually, the blacksmith. Shouldn't say that, should I, really? Yeah. Okay. Just change it around. When you go to the other area, I do. That's what I was saying. There time. you go. Exactly. 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 So. Bonjour, ça va? Très bien. Vous allez bien? So. This is where we do all the metal work, our ateliers uh, at work time and time again. <laughs> um, as I said, all of these are unique. These are examples of what people have. These are the particular, these are the, the cemetery registry boxes that you'll see in most cemeteries, not all cemeteries, but they're solid brass uh, and all designed and, and manufactured here. Um, very unique pieces. They are. Um, every single one. We, um, and, and each one of them uh, needs polishing, which is the other frustration. And you guys have, before you reconstruct, you photograph, bring them back here and try and get the same materials as well? More often than not, you tend to find that um, before they get to that situation, you'll take the whole thing and bring it back. Bring it back. So those back there, there's a couple there that have recently come out. That's a brand new one. Okay. That one is. Um, and again, you can see the same sort of variety. We have no two gates and no two 
parts of the steelwork are the same. They're all completely different. Uh, but they're important for me because they tend to be the first tactile experience someone has of entering a cemetery. So if the gate's broken or if the gate doesn't work or it doesn't swing, then we're already perceiving in someone's mind, are we doing our job properly? And one of the issues that's interesting for us from a commission point of view is because of what we do, it's very difficult to quantify what we do. How do you balance about resource in terms of where you put your resource? So for me, the issue for our cemeteries is they need people to go in them and say, you know, do they feel that they've been cared for? Because I'm, I'm going to take a punt that I have, I have specialists in all fields, so I have horticulturalists. Well, I go in a cemetery, I couldn't tell you whether the horticulture is superb or not. I don't recognise different plant varieties. I can tell you whether the grass needs cutting. Uh, you know, I don't need to be an expert to do that. I also know if I see a rusty or broken gate that it needs doing. So it's interesting to get people's perceptions about what they want from us in terms of site maintenance and site care um, and where we focus those resources because I can't afford to waste any money and I wouldn't want to. So things like gates and, and, and we've put a lot of effort in the last few years into maintenance, routine maintenance, things like the doors being painted, the same as anybody's house, isn't it? You know, that's what makes the difference is if you're, if your if your windows need painting, it doesn't matter how clean your garden is. So we we try and do that. So yes. So onward. We're going back out the back way. I'm getting waved at. Good. Yes, you did too. And then down that way, sir. One more. As if by magic. <laughs> Au revoir, bonjour. 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 Um, this is the um, this is the unsung department of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Um, we are the largest manufacturer of our of of. I'm going to be careful how I say this. We're the world's largest manufacturer of in-house signs. Because all of our sites have signs. They're some have unique. more than one, some have three, some have more. No other organisation, private or should I say individual organisation, does its own road signing. Which is a, a bit of a oddity. Because you kind of come into an organisation and you suddenly go, well, why are we doing our own road signs? No one else does. You, you don't go. But they've become iconic in their own right. And what we're finding is a lot of organisations who, um, as, as, as the heritage idea has come on, local communes have cottoned on to the idea of, well, you know, there's, there's our sign, but we've only got wood. We, direct, we, take, we, um, we show the direction from the centre of the closest commune. That's the logic behind how we signpost. But that doesn't help if you want people to come from another area. And what we find now is uh, French communities copy our signs. So they're copying our sign and putting our signs up. Same colour, same symbol. So I drive around and I'm suddenly thinking, I don't remember agreeing to that sign. Where's that kind of come from? That's not one of ours. Uh, it gets even better when they pointed the wrong direction, <laughs> as we had a, a complaint from four, four busloads of Canadians, actually, who'd gone the wrong way because they'd put, the, put it up the wrong way. Now, can, can we see uh, yeah, that sure. bus from on Mel? Yeah. Can you bring that down? Uh, is this from here? Yeah. 
uh, that'll be one of the original signs. Wow. And and now this one's just old. Yeah, that'll have been replaced. Do you think I can get a picture with my parla fellow parliamentarians uh, with this one? Yeah, I should think so, oh, sure. Yeah. Elizabeth Pierre. What would you do with the signs if they were replaced? Um, well, normally they're either, they're either kept for pattern reasons, so like a library of signs, what did the last one look like or such? Mm -hmm. That would be the most important reason to keep them. Maybe. Some some do go to museums or a, a thing mm -hmm. occasionally. We do get some on permanent loan. It might be nice to put one up at the Minister of Justice. Um, and then for if we've got more than one, as in we don't need a pattern, then we will either reuse the steel or we'll yeah. refurbish it. Here, let's go. Come on in, gentlemen. Yeah, let's please. Come on in. I think. Um, Oh, yeah, there we go. Come on. While you come. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the Ruhr march into uh, Germany, so Arnhem, Holland, right. and the Ruhr. But the huge bulk of the work is in Belgium and France okay. from the First World War, which the numbers you mean significantly yeah. outstrip the casualties of the Second World War. Thank you. There is many places like this, like Thank these, you. that Thank produce we, the, uh, No, no, this is the only place okay, where yeah. we produce road signs. Yeah. Uh, in and, fact, that's... And, uh, and the, how do you call it in English? And the headstones. Yeah, the headstones. Headstones, only place yeah, we yeah. produce is here, like um, the signs. How many employees here? Uh, here we've got just under 80 people in this particular 80? area. Okay. Um, hmm. But you see, we're doing it for everybody, so that's going out to the Middle East. Oh, yeah. Hmm. No, that's different. Do you not tell the difference? 